Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 845. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 27th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is where George and I are in our happy place, and we hope you're in your happy place watching us. Old geezers talk about the news going around the world. Now, I need to warn you up front here. January, the end of January, mid-February, end of February is pollen month. And uh, until last week, I was feeling pretty miserable. I'm a little better today. But I got this little little uh, throat thing in the bottom here, and I I'll go on my Google. I'll type "pollen near me," and it will tell me what pollen is bothering me. Uh, it's trees right now and some strange bushes. Uh, amazingly, ragweed, one of my my kryptonites, is not bothering me. George is over there. He's going <coughs> <coughs> and blowing his nose every once in a while. Just forgive us, right right up front. That's just how it works. Before we get too far into the show. I ask you, I plead with you, please like this on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, that gives us free advertising. Subscribed, if you're not subscribed, 29% of our audience is not subscribed. I don't, I don't understand that. In fact, if everybody was subscribed, I'd hit the next echelon in, in subscribers. I would hit 10,000, something I've been working on for almost a decade. But pff, that's just me complaining. Sorry about that. So... Uh, go to the comment section. Comments are live. Comments where the, the show continues, and you guys are great with comments. As you can see, George and I follow your comments and respond to many of them. George, how are you doing this week? Well, apart from all the cranky Catholic comments on our on our uh, viewers pages, I'm doing great. Had an interesting thing happen this Sunday. We had three new children. Uh, who don't speak English. Uh, mm -hmm. Their grandparents brought them up from Ecuador, five, seven, and nine. And Ecuador is going through a bit of a revolution, turmoil. And the parents are U.S. residents, and uh, the, uh, the grandparents are U.S. residents, and the parents asked the, them to take the children during this time of uncertainty. So uh, my wife is out today shopping for what I call Spanglish uh, uh, Spanish English uh, simple uh, children's resources uh, because we don't have enough to have a Spanish language and uh, Sunday school and the grandparents want to uh, sort of have the children learn English and become acculturated but uh, it's exciting times and and uh, this is an example of doing things right these are not uh, people crossing the border in El Paso no. uh, to look for a job or whatever these are true uh, uh, legal immigrants yeah. coming to the U.S. and uh, and uh, applying for they, asylum uh, the right way. I mean, there there is a way to apply for asylum in this country. You fly into customs in New York City, a JFK, Newark, anywhere you want. There's a customs office, and you, you go and you f fill out the forms. Yeah, and these you know children, the the grandparents and the parents' desire is for them to become Americanized, acculturated. Yeah not to become Ecuadorians who live in the United States until it's such time they've made a minute of money can go back home, but rather to enter into all the joys and the responsibilities of American life and citizenship. Okay. Now, this is... And one of those things is becoming a Protestant. <laughs> Protestant. Uh, yes. Leaving the Catholic Church <laughs> and becoming a Protestant. So. so, I mean, this is one of my biggest quandaries on the human condition. Uh South America has shown the exact, and uh, anything south of the Mexico border, has shown the, the, the rot of socialism, how it can be mm -hmm. corrupted so easily. And a, a nation like Venezuela will look over at Ecuador and say, we never want that. Ecuador will look over to uh, a different country and say, we never want that. That's horrible. They have a totalitarian over there. And the, every country looks at every other country and says, we never want that that in our country until the next election and then they let it back in you know and one of the things is that's all they know when pope francis gets up and complains about the evils of capitalism it's because all he knows is corrupt socialism and he never complains about corrupt socialism it's all he knows so i i pray for the day everybody can learn about free markets 
and use it properly. We got a lot of news out here, George. We're going to start and uh, head this broadcast to England, where the General Synod is meeting on behalf of the Church of England. And th listen, the taking up a, maybe a LLF amendment. There's typical race baiting. They're trying. You and I were try trying to, to discuss what type of analogy they have here. It, George is like, well, they're, they're just sinking the Titanic. And I'm, no, George, that Titanic has sank. <laughs> they're trying to raise that Titanic. You know, they found it at the bottom of the ocean, and they're, you're going to apply some balloons and try and raise it back up. Because, you know, for every intended purpose I can think of, they've lost their message, and they're just running around with their heads cut off. They got, they got nothing, they, nothing to offer, George. Now, let, let's clarify exactly. We're not saying the members of the Church of England have lost the plot and lost the message. Leadership. There are many Leadership. fine Christians, many fine clergy. Mm -hmm. The leadership, the people in charge, the people who set the agenda, they've lost the plot and they've sunk the ship. General Synod is meeting as we speak, and today they're debating LLF, so we won't be able to cover that fully, maybe in the next show. Uh, LLF uh, on uh, Monday night, there was some conversations uh, after a full day of, after several full days of absolute horror uh, about just how can you do things any worse? They don't seem to know. They just do them really bad. But the first thing out of that with the LLF were some amendments. And Ed Shaw, uh, who is a member of the Church of England Evangelical Council, put forward Amendment 66 on Monday night. And this amendment uh, had a little clause that uh, so to go to the motion to take note of the uh, LLF paper. And it said, some of the issues raised are not matters on which they cannot simply agree to disagree. So what Ed Shaw was saying is we need to have a statement here to saying that, you know, for some of us, we cannot agree to disagree because we feel this is a first order issue, not a second order issue. Basically, this basically states what the traditionalist worldview is, mindset is, and the mindset of many liberals. They cannot agree to disagree. This is right, and they're wrong. Um, well, Martin Snow, the Bishop of Leicester, who's been tasked with leading this through Synod, said, well, I agree with this in principle. We don't want to put down in writing that we cannot find a solution, because that then might close doors to solutions. Is that not the so most has, English sentence you've ever heard? Yes. It, so essentially, Snow was saying, we cannot afford to be honest because that could be seen to be, oh, unhelpful. We can't so be that transparent. Was, we, and if we discuss this, we have to do it in closed door sessions. Yeah. So if I were a traditionalist, I would start off by being extraordinarily discouraged because the validity of my worldview is not even recognized as being real. In other words, I cannot agree to disagree on this issue. I believe this is a moral issue, uh, same-sex marriage and genital same-sex relations. I believe scripture is quite clear that this is not of God. It is far from God's plan for our lives. And for me to say, well, that's okay for you, but not for me, is a terrible thing. There was a Catholic newspaper had an article critiquing the Pope uh, recently on the Pope's uh, uh, change on same-sex blessings, saying, we Catholics are now adopting the Anglican geographic morality uh, principle, which is what's right here is wrong there. So in the Anglican world, what is right in Manhattan is wrong in Nigeria. What's right in Miami is wrong here in Lakanto, where I live. And now the Church of England is adopting that principle. What is right in this parish across town is wrong in that parish. And the Catholics are saying Francis is going that way. But that is an apt description of yeah. what is trying to be memorialized by Martin Snow and the LLF process. T Tip O'Neill would say all morality is local in this, you know. Justin, Justin Welby gave a, a rather odd presidential address. First he did, uh, you know, why can't we all get along? 
we can't hate each other, love, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, at a certain point, I'm just hearing John Lennon in the background singing. But then he came up with this concept, we need to adopt a varietal geology, geometry or some, some some strange things that took me back to eighth grade math class where we had Venn diagrams and sets where I can be in communion with you, but not with you. But in other words, we have to look at ourselves as sort of autonomous planets spinning in the universe that we're in orbit with some and not with others, but we're all planets together. Now, how this relates to the unchanging truth of Jesus Christ, I'm not quite sure. But what Welby is saying is that we will institutionalize lying and prevarication and privilege political truths so as to get through the day over godly truths. And we will call it a parallelogram. <laughs> what on earth, George? You know, I, I've used parallelograms a lot since eighth grade in math <laughs> I know, class. I, like, I, th I mean, I don't know when somebody on the left is going to wake up and say, this is broke, <coughs> it's not going to work. And you're making a new lie every synod because you can't give up on the old lie. And I don't know, George, this... You and I kind of believe that the Church of England is over. Most of the Anglican communion believes the Church of England is over. The only people who don't believe it are in the leadership of the Church of England. And well, James they, Pace, who's, yeah. who's a, he's a vicar in Wimbledon, mm -hmm. uh, suburb of London, southwest London, a uh, friend of this show, announced on Sunday he was leaving the Church of England. Uh, just this is, he's reached that breaking point. Well, James is being particularly brave. It's a tough decision to make. Um, we have an editorial on Anglican Inc. that has had a very strong readership, 17,000 views in less than a week, reads, by Graham Anderson, who is a parish priest in the Church of England. And Graham basically holds most of the principles that uh, James Pace does, but his response is different. His response is, most of us traditional-minded clergy, or as he would say, Christian clergy, are going, doing what we call quiet quitting in America. In other words, we're just going to keep on making our focus and our life and our energy on our parish. We're not going to bother ourselves with what they're doing in London or at the diocesan offices or even at the deanery or archdeanery level. We're just going to basically do the minimum we have to in relation to the larger church and be faithful to the people placed under our pastoral charge. I have to admit that's the attitude I've had for a number of years. Um, you know, years ago, 20 years ago, I was on the standing National Standing Committee for Domestic Evangelism. And, you know, I was involved in this and that. And at a certain point, I realized that's not worth it. Then I was on the diocesan council here in Central Florida, off and on for 20 years. And I realized, you know, not much. This really doesn't mean anything. And for the last 10 years or so, almost all my energies have been focused on the parish life and the people here. Because at the end of the day, what the diocese says and does, what the national church says and does, what Justin Welby says and does, is of no consequence to three little children from Ecuador uh, who want to know the saving knowledge, whose grandparents want them to learn the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But no, hold on. It does matter to the Episcopal Church and to 815. 815 would prefer those th three little children in your church be victims and be brought out as victims of the how bad this country is at immigration and how corrupt we are at our borders and how we are not loving to other nations and uh the problem is not the socialism and uh revolution in their country the problem here is corrupt capitalism and the the, the, the new term is late stage capitalism and they want to distort and lie about what the real problem is the real problem is these ch children need to find jesus and mm -hmm. George's church is helping do that. They don't need to find victimhood. If somebody tells you are, you are, if somebody is telling you that you are a victim, that, that's a lie. 
And that's a lie all the way back from the garden. And it's not changing. Well, get, getting back to the, the hot mess, which is the Church of England, um, so far <clears throat> they've talked about clergy salaries. To give reference, in the United States, we may not know how bad they have it in the Church of England. The average clergy salary in the Church of England last year was 27,000 pounds for That's a vicar or pre- 35,000 U.S. Roughly. 30, 34. Um, in my diocese, the minimum salary that you would pay someone just out of seminary, no experience, only education, and I'll do it all in pounds so we keep across the board, is 55,000 pounds. That's the minimum salary. And in England, that's almost half what the average priest make. I make, I hate uh, not to be vulgar, but I make probably five times the average salary of the Church of England cler- clergy. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I have a wealthy church. It's not because I fiddle the books, but because in the United States, we have grids. It's like the army. Size of your church, number of years of seniority, you go over, here's the box. And so this is what I make. And I still make less than uh, well, school administrators, <laughs> uh, make more than teachers do. <clears throat> but there was, a, uh, there was a speech in General Synod, and it was a young guy, fellow from Norwich. And I have to say, I was looking at the video, and the guy missed his calling to be a communist agitator. He's like five feet tall. He's got like little wire rim glasses, little goatee, you know, little Trotsky type. And his, his voice was, you know, all he needed to go was brothers and sisters and, you know, put his thumbs under his braces, and he would have been a good union official. He was saying, you know, the average stipend of a Church of England priest is now less than the starting salary of a school teacher in the U.K., um, the Church of England and Ian Paul put forward Ian Paul, another friend of this show, member of the Archbishop's Council and General Synod, put forward a motion saying we need to change clergy salaries. Um, it'll cost twenty-five million dollars to improve the mess we're in, twenty-five million pounds, and we've got almost a billion in assets, ready cash, security, stocks in the Church commissioners to do this. And the church and the powers that be, no, we don't want to do this. And yet, Welby and company are going to spend a hundred million pounds on slavery reparations. They passed an asinine racial thing of just to appease Rose Hudson Wilkes, who's a Bishop of Dover and a professional race hustler. Race uh, Bayer, Fanny, yes, yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, the well, I won't make analogies, but uh, the Maxine Waters of the Church of England. Yeah. Uh, and they've got money so that you've got wasted time and energy and resources for every parish to have a race officer and this and that. But they don't solve the basic problem that your clergy are being starved, that they cannot function. And sometimes when they have trouble, they're told to go to Christian's against poverty to help you budget, you know, it's the foolishness of the leadership. Um, because clergy salaries are one thing that unites people across the political spectrum. Well, in uh, England, you have inherited money, it's a hard life. In the UK, the problem is not that they don't have access to the funds. The problem is they're not making clergy salary a priority. To the benefit, and I'm going to compliment the Episcopal Church on this, a long time ago in the in late 60s and 70s, they said, we need to make sure that this doesn't bite us in the butt in a generation and a couple of decades down the road. They put together a wonderful pension plan. They put together well, actually, this system. Yes? It was before that, it was almost over 100 years ago, that a man named J.P. Morgan That's true. Yeah. made a major gift yeah. to fund the Episcopal Church pension program. Yeah. And the Episcopal Church has long, long operated on the principle that a clergy salary should be on the same level, roughly, as a military officer's salary. So I make roughly what a lieutenant colonel in the army makes. Um, You're an E3, eh? <laughs> so, you know. And, but but yeah. in other words, that's been over 100 plus years. Yeah. 
But what you're talking about is when the Church of England got rid of the glebe system, that's where right. local parishes had their local income from land or investments and this and that, and that's how they paid their clergy. So some churches paid this, some churches paid that. Instead, we're going to centralize it all. And what has happened with the centralization is that the ratio of clergy to administrators has just gone skyrocket. So they're probably now one administrator for every two clergy in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. So the money is being sucked out of the parish work into race officers, women's officers, ecumenical officers, communications officers. Candle wax Building. research. I know. I, I, yes. Yeah, the, the the one place worse that you'll find administration death is the American education system. You know, so it's crazy. Uh, have we done this one to death or you want to talk about, oh, oh yeah, we've safeguarding, got, uh, the, the safeguarding. Safeguard, we, we did clergy salaries. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we got two. Rose Hudson Wilkes put forward a resolution. Uh -huh which the Church of England sort of likes to do is virtue signaling about how we're all going to be nice and lovey-dovey and this and that. Total waste of time. And the thing is, it's not mandatory. So, but the church will spend money on it and the vast majority of churches will ignore it. Uh, safeguarding. Safeguarding was the major fiasco of so far. We haven't finished with LLF. Church of England has spent over a million pounds in reports, uh, the Wilkinson report, the Jay report, other investigations, how to better do safeguarding, because safeguarding has been a total fiasco. Total fiasco. It's almost reached the point of either moral idiocy or criminal uh, m malevolence. Well, the uh, Church of England Synod has decided to ignore all the recommendations put forward by the, the leaders in this field and leave safeguarding to the amateurs and the buffoons who have messed things up so far. They're gonna study it. They're gonna keep the power and accountability within the church. They're not gonna do any out investigations independently. And the response of course, from the abuse people is outrage. They've been promised all these things. You know, Justin Welby was supposed to meet with the uh, victims of uh, John Smythe uh, seven years ago. Any day now that's going to happen, I'm sure. And so this, so that the, the Church of England is tempting Parliament to step in and take over this because they are just so criminally inept. And now we had calls at the uh, uh, criminally inept in the sense of it's far past the point where you can ignore these things or claim ignorance, but rather when you privilege the protection of the administration and the leaders at the top over the care of victims, uh, you just, no, I think a part of it is Part of, part of it is like we had another news all the way around the world in Tasmania. Uh, a court in Tasmania threw out a settlement from about 20 years ago where a boy was abused by an abusive priest. And this priest was protected by the diocese and even promoted after he abused this child and it became known, became an archdeacon. Uh, the fellow eventually wound up in jail when the police got onto it. And the Supreme Court in Tasmania threw out the quarter of a million or hundred thousand dollar settlement from 20 years ago and awarded the boy two and a half, who's a man now, two and a half million Australian dollars for damages. And part of it, it could be the Church of England is hoping against hope to protect itself and not go down the road that many U.S. Catholic dioceses have gone to have hundreds of millions of dollars in judgments for abuse. I mean, it's looking like that the financial considerations are now driving everything to dissimulate, to delay, to deny, um, not refuse to take responsibility. Well, the Roman Catholic and Church, well, the Roman Catholic Church in the 70s and 80s was the poster child for why safeguarding needs to be third party, why all investigations mm -hmm. need to be conducted outside of the church. Uh, we've seen this within the ACNA where they immediately bring in a third party to investigate allegations. And 
the Church of England now has joined that fray of people who have proven the point. Safeguarding needs to be conducted outside the realm of the authority of the church. Uh, I would say the outside the realm of the authority of the government as well, to where we can have an honest discussion about what happened to these victims, how we're going to help these victims, and how the church can avoid doing this in the future. And we're not seeing that because it, safeguarding in English speak is a scapegoat. Yeah. And Ian, Ian Paul in his speech to Senate said, we're at the precipice here. We're at the precipice. Christianity in England is not declining. It's the Church of England that's declining. And we need to do, we need to act on several fronts. Mm -hmm. And the powers that be have decided to act on no front except for virtue signaling to have some racial, you know, more race officers and uh, um, things like that. So they distracting themselves with pointless and useless things um, and ignoring safeguarding, ignoring clergy morale and pay and ignoring the, uh, the diversity of views on human sexuality to ram through a polite lie. Well, let's finish up this uh, little talk on the Church of England Synod. Justin Lobby gave a response to a member's question about, hey, you recommended this lady who was the head of the post office to be a bishop, and, you know, clearly she was not the best choice. What say you? And what say he, George? And in a written response to a question on Paula Venels, the former chairman of the post office, who was also a non-stipendary priest whom well be pushed to be the Bishop of London, because of her management skills, and she was a consultant to the House of Bishops on management. Welby said, yes, mistakes were made. We should have looked into this more deeply, and lessons will be learned. In essence, nothing to do with me, folks. Not my problem, not my fault. Somebody else will basically take the hit for this. If Justin Welby had any character or integrity, he would have resigned. Um, there is something, though, that I don't, in his defense, I don't know. It, Justin Welby recently spoke in the House of Lords. Uh, David Cameron, former prime minister, is now the foreign minister. He's now Lord Cameron, I think, of something or other. And Justin Welby gave a speech, in, asked questions and responded to Cameron's speech. And one of two things happened. Either Welby was so animated that he could not hold his papers still. His, he would make hand gestures, his hands were fine, but when he held his papers, his hands were shaking very markedly. He may have onset of Parkinson's disease. It, I mean, I'm not a neurologist, yeah. but I've got a lot of Parkinson's people here, and I've watched the progression of Parkinson's disease over the years, and it sort of starts with, you know, holding something with your hands. That's when you shake. You can move your hands... Maybe he's maybe we're seeing the beginning of Parkinsonian syndrome here, which is a horrible, and he's not, horrible disease. not the man that he once was. Yeah, because exactly. Parkinson's not only is the physical decline, there's a mental decline that goes with it as well. We saw that with uh, Pope France, uh, Pope Jan, uh, not Benedict, Pope uh, John Paul uh, mm -hmm. died, of, uh, died of Parkinson's. Uh, once again, uh, yeah, this this is a hard hitting show. But we do this for two purposes, one to inform you and one to give you something to pray about. We want you to pray for uh, the leaders of the church. We want you to pray for the Justin Welbeads, the Michael Currys, the Archbishop Foley's, because that is our job in this, to lift these people up in prayer. And hopefully you're doing it in the daily office. Well, I think we'll put up on AI the uh, the clip and let people yeah. judge for themselves. I, I, actually, I'm gonna, I, the clip will be edited into this. So they'll when you described it, they will have saw it, seen it, sued it, something like that. All right, George, let's move on. We've talked about this enough. Uh, sadly, we often report on persecution going around the world uh, for Christians. And 
there's not a, a week that goes by. We don't report on an African nation. We don't report on a, a an Asian nation or North Korean nation or a Chinese nation where Christians are actively persecuted for their faith. And the desire in many of the nations is to replace the faith. China wants to replace the Christian faith with the love of the chairman, with the love of the party. The party is your fellowship. The party is your religion. And they don't want to do that so much in other countries. They just want to eliminate you and your faith. And you find that in violent Islam. You find that uh, uh, in certain places. We saw that the collapse of Sudan into two nations. I think we'll see Nigeria fall into two nations within the decade. And they don't care. The answer to Christians is to persecute and kill, George. And here we go again in Africa. Yeah, as Kevin says, it's been a bad week in China, Hong Kong, Africa. Uh, on Sunday, just this past Sunday, uh, jihadists, Muslim terrorists, walked into a church in Burkina, Burkina, Burkina Faso, which is a which used to be called Upper Volta, and opened fire with submachine guns, killing 15 people, wounding as many more. Same day, uh, at least a dozen people were killed in the Plateau State in Nigeria by Fulani Muslim terrorists. We have reports in the eastern Congo that the Alliance ADF, which is uh, uh, the uh, a Muslim guerrilla group, raided a Christian village, destroyed, that killed many people. Uh, what was the other one? Um, four monks on Sunday were murdered in Ethiopia by suspected jihadists. This is two days ago. And you know, not a thousand people, not a massacre like on October 7th, but this is daily, weekly. Um, from Mozambique, across Congo, Sudan, South Sudan, Nigeria, West Africa, murder is becoming commonplace where the victims are Christian. China, we're not seeing open murder. We're seeing the government squeezing religion. Uh, Islam has been the more of a focus in the past few months where Islam is essentially told to adopt Chinese characteristics and thoughts and place loyalty to the state above loyalty to Allah. So imams are arrested and mosques are being demolished or they're having their distinctive Chinese Muslim architecture removed. At the same time, there's a pressure on Anglicans and Presbyterians and Catholics in Hong Kong to amalgamate their churches with the uh, three self-patriotic movement or the patriotic Catholic Church. The uh, unspoken aim is to sinicize the independent churches of Hong Kong and bring them into the fold of official Chinese Catholicism, which means uh, destroying uh, the doctrine and discipline of the Anglican Church of Hong Kong, for example. Um, they, and in these days, Chairman Xi and company, they don't care what the United States says or Britain says or anybody says. There's no outside, you know, they don't care what the Vatican says. They're going to do what they're going to do, and they're going to do it slowly, but the ratchet is being tightened, and it's only going in one direction, which is squeezing the churches into total compliance and submission to the state. I don't know, George. I thought we had a solution. Uh, and I'm going back to the uh, uh, Obama administration. There was a, a mean tyrant over in a foreign country named Coney, K-O-N-Y, and uh, Michelle Joseph Obama. Joseph Coney. Yep, Mo and Michelle Obama and many others uh, showed up with a little picture on Instagram or Facebook holding a little piece of paper that was a white piece of paper, and on there were the, the black letters Coney 2012. And that was the year we're going to get this despot. And we can do this by making awareness through social media. And just that awareness of, alone will follow him to die and, and, and go to hell. And that's about the best the West can offer in helping with 
Christian persecution. We can make noise and make it uh, something that's uh, transparent, but we don't have the ability to stop it. Well, we used to give uh, weapons to the Ugandan army to fight yeah. uh, Kony and the Lord, Liber Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, in northern Uganda. Uh, and they did a good job with weapons and with advisors training them how to conduct anti-terrorist operations and neutralize the LRA. Nowadays, the, Obama, uh, the Biden administration has uh, stopped all that assistance because uh, Uganda has uh, draconian uh, anti-gay laws, in their opinion. So we're now seeing a resurgence of guerrilla activity in northern Uganda and, and western Uganda because uh, we're, we, we, our domestic policies drive our foreign policy. And if you're not on board the gay agenda or the climate change agenda or the contraception agenda or the vaccine agenda you don't get the bucks you need to help your country in a difficult time the rainbow connection that's what you have to be you have to be for george uh now i'm looking through our stories we partially covered half these stories just in 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 our, a couple of rabbit trails we covered uh persecution africa did we cover yeah we qu covered uh, quit uh quiet quitting in c of e we covered Michael Curry. Um, oh, did we not talk? Yet. No, no, we didn't. We did. I'm sorry, people. We did not cover M Michael Curry going public with e classical trials, and but that's the worst pronunciation that I ever heard. <laughs> e classical trials, and uh, he mentioned Sam Howard, Prince Singh, uh, Curry, and Outsling, Paul Gordon, Chandler. We need to talk about this because it's kind of the opposite of what a Catherine Jefford Shorey did. As far as Catherine yeah. Jefferts Shorey, she she did what Justin Welby does. It's not happening here. Look elsewhere. Catherine Jefferts Shorey was a control freak. She was also well. Catherine Jefferts Shorey was Catherine Jefferts Shorey. Yeah. Um, Michael Curry has decided to release and make public all the current proceedings against bishops for disciplinary purposes. In the past, this was a strictly tightly guarded secret. The boys club, the girls club did not sh wash its dirty lawn in, linen in public. Michael Curry has decided we're going to be more transparent about this. You can assign motives uh, to Curry all you want, but at the end of the day, he did the right thing. And they published the uh, chronology, if you will, the uh, uh, docket entries of the cases against several bishops. Prince Singh, retired Bishop of Rochester, former provisional bishop of Western and Eastern Michigan, has two cases against him that arise from a messy divorce. His ex-wife and two adult sons are accusing him of abuse and conduct on becoming a member of the clergy. And they, the, the Singh family have also filed charges against Michael Curry and his assistant, Bishop Todd Owsley, allegedly for slow walking the Singh investigation. We've not made much of the charges against Curry because essentially these are a nasty divorce where somebody has decided they're basically going to burn down everything out of rage. It's well, um, we have trouble reporting he said, she said. I mean, we, we yeah, need a little bit more than that before it appears on Anglican Unscripted. And no, I don't believe... Uh, my personal opinion, uh, Singh, as an unfortunate fellow who had a nasty divorce, whether it's true or not, I don't think will ever be known. Mm -hmm. But uh, his wife has tried to destroy his remaining career. And uh, she's so angry, she's going to take down everybody who doesn't agree with her. So maybe I'll now get, I'll now get a charge against me for for uh, conduct unbecoming, for not believing her implicitly. So I, I, I just don't think there's a lot of merit in those charges. Sam Howard, the recently retired Bishop of Florida, has two charges against him. One for discrimination. In June of 23, he was charged with forbidding partnered gay clergy from moving and taking jobs in the Diocese of Florida. And that was an act of discrimination. Now, this is a... Uh, 
more politically oriented because unless Howard was so dumb as to say in writing, I'm not bringing you in because you're gay, there's no case here because the bishop has absolute right to refuse to receive anybody. I don't like the look of your face sort of thing. And, you know, before I settled into this parish, I got refused by a dozen dioceses when I'd be a foot call because of my politics. Well, you're not allowed to do that. But it was never my politics. It was always, we don't like the look of your face or, you know, you're, you're too fat for this church, stuff like that. So <laughs> Howard may skate on that. And the second charge is financial misconduct while Bishop of Florida. And that I don't know any details about. And they haven't reached the details. So we'll see what comes there. Financial cases are the preferred case when you're doing these things because they're either true or not true because an accountant accounting will answer those questions. Right. There's a case against the Bishop of Wyoming, Paul Gordon, it's hyphenated first name, Chandler, who uh, has been stood down He's been put, placed on administrative leave by the National Church for for basically personal conduct, which and now these uh, docket entries do not list the details of the charges, but it's uh, I think it's we're, we're dealing with adultery here or some sort of. In, in any case, there's more evidence than the church is comfortable with, and they're they're willing to stand down. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what do you Mike keeps there? falling over. I okay. keep getting excited. Uh, uh, we pay all this money for you to have a, a, a wonderful studio with a good earpiece, a wonderful microphone. The lighting you have now is wonderful. So just hold the mic. Okay, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> That's right. No, no, no. So, so, those, so those were publicly made known. And coincidentally, uh, one of the complainants in the uh, uh, Rook case in Upper Midwest released to the members of that diocese their complaint. And so far, you know, no one had ever seen it because it's supposed to be confidential. And we sort of agonized, should we release this? Because, you know, this might prejudice the case. But it was released to the members of the diocese and it, it, was, no, it was no longer a private document, it was a public document. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's pretty much what we thought it was with this about Rook, that. His crime was being foolish, I think. Uh, I, I think the implication is the, the implication is lack of discernment, more than foolishness. That uh, he promoted people who, for better or worse, should have had more supervision over them um, and more accountability. And this is the pro. I, this is the problem always. In Christianity, we are part of a kingdom. Where one of the heroes of the faith, one of the first apostle, killed Christians before he came to faith. He mm -hmm. was known by everybody out there, Christians and, and Jews and Greeks uh, and Romans. Uh, that's Paul, the Christian killer. You go, Paul. And uh, so when he came to faith, it was a bit of a surprise. And for whatever reason, there's not a lot of... Uh, um, built-in structure back then, but Paul turned out to be an okay uh, apostle. We think that we can replicate the Pauls and not have an existing uh, accountability structure. Uh, I've gone to churches where uh, people who suffered greatly for dr drug addiction and uh, alcohol abuse uh, gave that up, re uh, reformed their lives, and after a year or so started to move up into church leadership. But there was always a council with the priest. Are you still clean? It was like an AA meeting, you know, that uh, the priest would have with the, these people. Are you still clean? Or have you have you fallen? At, you know, what can I help you with? And this was something that was done almost quarterly with these people coming up and out of uh, the situation with which they found themselves. And I don't think we in Christendom do that at all. We're quick to hire and say this guy is this guy is a public poster child of what's good in Christianity. He used to uh, be a, a, a molester of little children. He's reformed. He now leads the, the Sunday school. <sighs> so I just like, you know, we need to be very careful here. And I think what my just quick read of this is 
a discernment issue. Is that is that a crime, George? No, it's well. It is something that you should be disciplined for, but it should be a smack on the hand. Don't do it again. Yeah, yeah. or it's we can not an instance of moral it. turpitude. Right. It's not you know. It's not evil. It's not willful blindness. It's an experience, naivete, lack of discernment, something that you should be chastised for, and then get on with your life and ministry and make do a better job as these things come down in the pike in the future. Um, but again, be, be, we live in such a polarized society that the people who dislike Bishop Rook and have brought these things view his the charges against him as he's another monster when it's quite clear if we take everything they accuse him of as true it doesn't rise to the level of moral turpitude it's just oh how could you be so dumb but you could say that about me yeah i know <laughs> just like, <laughs> if if anybody ever interviews mrs Coulson, the i don't know how he he's so stupid yeah you, know, you, you get a lot of that um and <sighs> I don't see a crime here, but I do see a situation that we can correct it, and even even better than corrected, it, it can be redeemed. And you know, let, let's see what happens there. Uh, the people, is there a trial going on? Um, I've heard super secret uh, whispers, and I've had conversations with people that I have sworn not to reveal that maybe there's a trial going on soon or happening currently but i can't i can't comment further than that i uh, thought he was just gonna be on double secret probation oh, yeah you, you go to wilbur high there of course let's see here um do we cover everything um the oklahoma yeah. transgender thing yeah before we get to there before people stop clicking off the show, uh, I, I usually maintain a 95% audience up to 40 minutes. Before you click off the shows, we're raising money. I can't help you with that. <laughs> Siri can't help me raise money. <laughs> well, too bad for you. If you were an AI, Siri, you could. Uh, we're raising money to send George to Latrobe. The uh, ACNA is having their once every 10 year uh, pick a new archbishop uh convention going on and we were there last time i want to send george there this time and i'm going to need to raise a couple thousand dollars gotta get plane tickets uh a taxi ride to the airport food i'll probably have to pay a uh, a press fee pass to be at the acna event and uh that's gonna cost money i'm, I'm booking maybe 1500 to 2000 to donate the best way to do that is to go to anglican tv tv or anglican.inc and click the donate button up there on the right hand side it'll take you to paypal or it gives you the address where you can send a check and that's the best way to do it and it's okay if you want to give me a hundred that's fine it's okay if you want to give me five that's fine but what you're doing is helping us be on site to conduct news we sent george to kagala we sent kevin and george to all f uh previous gafgans and we were the news channel of um, just where you want. We were the, the great lady, so to speak. And we want that to continue. So if you could uh, help donate, I would need at least uh, 10 of you to give 100. That'd be great. <laughs> but if you could do more, that'd be great as well. All right, that's that. Let's move on to the next story. What was the next story, George? Next Benedict in Oklahoma. Yes. What's that story? I can't think of story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go for it. The, uh, we had a recent, uh, a 13 year, I think it's 13 or 15 year old child, a transgender child, a boy who identified as a girl. Mm -hmm. And their new name that they chose was Nex as a first name. Uh, got in a fight in the ladies' room at the high school they attended in the suburbs of, Oak, of Tulsa. And two days, a day and a half later, died. And the police investigated. There were video cameras and everything. But before any information was released, the drums began to beat. And we were looking at, if you will, the transgender uh, George Floyd incident. Matthew Shepard. And 
and so the yeah. liberal press are so talking about transgender violence. Now, uh, forget the fact that, you know, the transgender person uh, are far more prevalent in these violent things than being victims. The victims of transgender violence, usually prostitutes are killed in their work. Seldom are they the targeted victims in the United States, maybe different elsewhere. But this was a case where we have a poor child murdered by evil girls in a high school. Allegedly. And, allegedly. Allegedly. And the press got involved. And now the Episcopal Church in that suburb is having vigils for next Benedict, you know, praying, uh, turning it into a second Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard, 20 odd years ago, was a gay man who was killed in Wyoming and is now uh, on the road to canonization in the Episcopal Church for being murdered because he was gay, when the reality was that he died at the hands of his gay partner in a drug deal gone wrong. The police have now invest released their videos and the autopsy is forthcoming, uh, but initial reports say that the child had no bruises. The child instigated the fight in the ladies' room against two girls squirted water at them. And the, the video that was released has her admitting that she started the fight. He, she started the fight. She instigated it, that she was not hurt, that she's in the hospital uh, as a precaution. And this is all on a body cam from a police officer. And so basically what this is, is there was no transgender victimization. This was a, a mentally confused child who got in a fight, picked a fight with two girls in the ladies' room, and the girls shoved back. Um, and the autopsies, uh, the exact cause of death has not yet been determined, but it is quite clear this was not a homicide. This was not manslaughter. Uh, this was something. But instead, we have the liberal Twitter class, if you will, uh, and the uh, local Episcopal Church jumping whole hog into a lie. Um, and that's one of the motifs. Now, I accuse the Church of England of living a lie with Martin Snow's uh, torpedoing uh, Ed Shaw's uh, uh, amendment to recognize that we not of one mind. But the United States culture and the Episcopal Church is living a lie. This recognition of, you know, I'll be, I'll get ourselves canceled, Kevin, by saying there are only two sexes, male and female, and you don't switch between the two. Uh, I'm, I'll say other things get us canceled, but I may have said that for another show. But we're living a lie where, for political purposes, for virtue signaling purposes, to be seen to be au courant with the latest bourgeois fads, the Episcopal Church is jumping in whole hog. It's akin to the Rose Hudson Wilkes racism and the Archbishop's racism, racist uh, committee. Uh, doing something to be seen to do something that a few uh, zealots think will change the world when the reality is all they're doing is promoting lies. I have to say England is one of the least racist countries I've ever been to. And yet the way the Church of England paints English culture is inherently racist, which is absolute nonsense. Um, it's just not true. Yet this, these lies are promulgated and repeated ad nauseum. So I, my wife is talking to my, our daughter, who's 28 years old, who's all into, she's a typical of her age. She says she's so sad reading about the murder of a transgender girl a transgender girl in uh, Oklahoma. And Laura, Claude, Laura, my wife said to me, what's that all about? I said, don't even go there. Just because, you know, maybe that's foolish of me not to want to fight with my child over the lies that you've been fed by TikTok. But uh, we live in a lie culture right now. Yeah, and Where we, we have... So, something went option. weird with your microphone, but I, I can fix that in post. One of the things we do is... We see the lie, and we used to, to fight the lie. But now, even Christians like you and I, there's, there's lies worth fighting for, and there's lies that we will fight another day. And I, I 
I've slowly seen this transgender lie work its way out because of what's called here in America malpractice suit. And right now, malpractice uh, insurance companies are raising uh, the price of insurance for trans doctors through the roof. It's almost as bad as getting homeowner's insurance here in Florida. And so uh, that is how this eventually stops. In fact, all the stupid things uh, kids have done in the last 35 years has been stopped by legal efforts and in the, in, in the courts. And we have to hope and pray that that happens here because we somehow have been able to, to convince our children who are unsupervised that lobbying off their genitals will make them feel better. And I, it, that's as evil as evil gets. Some of the lies that uh, are being peddled today is the lie that uh, uh, unless you allow a child to undergo these surgeries, they'll be suicidal. Not There's true. actually no scientific evidence to that effect. Yeah. It's actually quite different. The scientific evidence is that those who have undergone these surgeries have a higher risk of incident of self-harm and suicide. There's the lie that psychological psychiatric conversion therapy is harmful. That, of course, is a lie, and the scientific literature is quite clear. Now, the, the politicized psychology literature, you know, it may differ, but the actual bona fide scientific literature shows that conversion therapy is not harmful. It's actually beneficial for those who seek it. Any therapy for someone who doesn't want it is harmful. That's not yeah, new any. to any issue. Yeah. The Church of England's, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't acknowledge the existence of the ex-gay movement. They say that you cannot change your sexual orientation. You cannot not be uh, gay if you identify as gay at a certain point. In your life. You cannot pray it away. Yes, yeah, and, and we know that to be a lie. Kevin and I know dozens. I don't, I, I, well, I've been involved in this fracture long enough that I would say I know dozens of people and their testimony of uh, people who said, I don't want to be this any this way anymore. I live in shame being this way and have sought the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the kingdom first, and found a way out of it, a way out of that lifestyle to which they, could ne they, they were ne never tempted to return. Now that's quite a change. And yeah. it's not just George and Kevin saying this. You go on to uh, YouTube or to Twitter and look up Rosario Butterfield, sure. yeah. former lesbian who has converted, if you will, and is a Christian and speaks eloquently and scientifically about these things. Mm. But, the, you know, I guess we start from this is that the leadership of the church and so many clergy and, so, and a good number of lay people buy into the lies of the world. And, you know, we used to make fun of the 60s church and Jack Spong is the church of what's happening now. That is true in every generation of churches trying to be with it and putting their faith in culture rather than gospel of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And his truths don't change. But the culture does change. And when we follow the culture, we're just accelerating the decline. As we said earlier, Christianity in England is not dying. It's the Church of England that's dying because the Church of England's abandoned Christianity. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode... Come on. It says 845 there somewhere. 845 on Anglican. <laughs> I'm